Patrick Grant. So a uh, saviour of 150-odd-year-old British clothing manufacturers, um, Savile Row Taylor, campaigner, TV presenter, The Sun, uh, newspaper The Sun, uh, called you TV's new number one pinner. You have um, forged a, 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 an impressive path. Now, the question is, um, <laughs> d did you ever think you would end up where you are today? I didn't think I'd end up in Blackburn, that's for sure. But I didn't think I'd not end up in Blackburn, if I might say that as well. No, I don't know that I don't think I ever imagined quite... I don't think I ever sat around and imagined a specific future for myself. But I don't think that in my wildest dreams... I mean, there have been certain moments where I'm doing something at work and I look, sort of look up and I think I'm having dinner with King Charles or I'm like, I'm playing Trivial Pursuit with Kate Moss or I'm doing whatever. Like, like things happen and you're like, how on earth did I end up here? You know, I'm in the back of a cab with Vivian Westwood or like just things that when I was a kid, you know, all this stuff was a was a was a different world and actually mm. ending up being in this world and being very much part of this world um certainly not something i expected you know as a kid i was really interested in making stuff in science and in engineering and i you know i did my a levels and did my undergraduate degree and all that when funnily enough i'm sort of going back full circle back round to that because now what i do is much more about engineering and manufacturing and all the rest of it for a spell 20 years or so i was flouncing around in london doing sort of fashiony stuff and uh, yeah i mean i didn't ever think i wouldn't be doing it but it certainly wasn't what i imagined and and i guess from from the outside in it might look like a sort of constant process of, of career reinvention is there, is there has there been a common thread uh oh, through yeah. through Good this all, all of these endeavors well, I think that there is a common thread through everything that I've ever done. And I think, you know, when I first started, I did, I did, I did science and, and engineering as a, as A levels and, and at university. And then I worked in, in manufacturing for a number of years. And everywhere that I worked was, were businesses that were concerned with doing things as well as they possibly could. Mm. And wherever I was, you know, whether it was engineering a, a piece of cable or I worked, you know, during during my year in France, doing my Erasmus year, I did a work placement at a ceramic tile factory, factory in Portugal. And I worked at a brewery in Hartlepool in my year in industry. And wherever I worked, I was always in businesses that really tried to make good things. And then when I started, when I switched from working in engineering and manufacturing, that kind of world, to working on Savile Row, which I did when I was 34, I can't remember, 2005, 33. Um, I think I met you not, not long after. That. Obviously, what Norton and Sons stood for, well, at the time, it didn't stand for very much. But what I made it stand for was a deep care with only making the very best things, making them in the very best way, using the very best materials. So going back to all the things that I'd always learned at, at university and in my previous career, which was try always to do something that's really, really going to work fantastically well in all situations and work for a really long time and give people a lot of great enjoyment in using it. And that was the case at Norton's. It was certainly the case at Etorts where we started to do ready to wear. And, you know, I went out and I found a network of amazing British factories that all made extraordinary stuff and all were staffed by people who really, really deeply cared about making good things. When I bought Cookson and Clegg, which is where I am today in Blackburn, you know, they were a manufacturer who had manufactured for about 160 odd years. They'd made good stuff. And for the last 70 odd years of their existence, they'd been a military clothing manufacturer. So they had made stuff that literally was life or death mm. for the people for whom they made it and then community clothing has all of that same stuff in it so it is it is about trying to make really really good things that people really like wearing and mm. making them in a way that does the minimum amount of harm when it's produced and does mm. the minimum amount of harm when people have finished using it and in the case mm. of our clothes now you know hopefully just as it is with norton's and it was with torts mm. these clothes last a really really long time quality has been at the heart of everything that i've done you know, yes a consistent thread throughout everything has been an endeavor to do things in an uncompromising way and in a way that delivers not only great quality, but great value to people. I mean, community clothing is extraordinary value. Norton & Sons is bloody expensive, but it's still actually really good value because well, the stuff all, I, you know. I purchased precisely one suit from Norton & Sons. And I think, I think when we first met, you said when Lord Carnarvon opened Tutankhamun's yeah. tomb with wearing Norton, and there's a whole list of other illustrious explorers yeah. like, we should make one for you, Ben. And, and I think you said, oh, we'll, we'll do it, you know, kind of mates rates, you know, heavy discount. And I, I can't remember the number now, but I, I think I yeah. fell off my chair. I was pretty yeah. broke. But I did come back a couple of days later. I'd landed a couple of sponsors and things, but feeling a bit more flush and, and had a 
soup made. And um, I, I'm convinced this thing will a- outlive me. I mean, uh, Blashford Snell had that sort of amazing mm. explorer's jacket made. I mean, that thing will last 200 years. I mean, it was made out of the most bomb-proof. I mean, how you how he ever wore it in, you know, Panama and places like that? I mean, it's like a 24-ounce tweet. But, you know, <laughs> he's made of tough stuff. And you mentioned um, Cooks and Clegg. 2015, you saved it from closure. To me, as a, as a you know, kind of Philistine outside, obviously, I, I wear clothes like most people, but I don't know a lot about the industry. It strikes me that the, the UK used to be this sort of textile manufacturing powerhouse. And, 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 mm. and it, it's... It's almost gone full circle from from cottage industry, literally like pre-industrial revolution, to cottage industry all, all over again. Like, what what, what happened? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's a really it's a fascinating arc, actually. I mean, we were we were a textile powerhouse. We were a textile powerhouse for all sorts of interesting reasons. I mean, some good reasons and some bad reasons. But we were, um, I mean, we 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 were we were an early powerhouse in clothing because we had we had wool. And we, so, mm. so we, we, we had good wool and we made a lot of money out of wool in the sort of 13th, 14th and 15th centuries. We were also a place that was very open to immigration. So we managed mm. to allow people like the Huguenots and others who mm. came, fl- who fled Europe as refugees, came to us as refugees, who brought an amazing amount of different skill to our textile industry in lots of different areas, lots of fine spinning, lots of jacquard weaving, lots of silk weaving, all sorts of different mm. things. We also had a fairly unique setup because we had we had early guilds and the guilds kind of um, established a, a criteria for quality that everybody had to uphold. And also we established a certain amount of competition between different guilds. So there were, I think at one stage there were three different sort of guilds or guild equivalents that were all managing textile and they all competed against one another. And of course that meant that they all had to really, really do their best. And so we got to a point where we were really pretty big in textiles and we were entirely self-sufficient in textiles until really the sort of early 18th century when we started to import cotton in, in big quantities. We then went through the industrial revolution by our own ingenuity we managed to develop all of the kits that mm. really really transformed the production of high quality high volume textile or higher volume textiles and at the same time because of our excellence in colonization and and global wielding of of brutal power we managed to grab hold of the supply of cotton that we needed to feed the industry that we had and at one point in time we made almost 70 percent of all the world's cotton textiles in this country in an area that's about 40 miles around where i'm sitting today i mean it was the most extraordinary period in history like this tiny little area made most of the world's cotton textiles but we also still had a big wool textile industry and still a reasonable sized linen industry and then and then everyone else kind of caught up. Most of the world's high quality cotton used to be made in India. And, you know, it was grown, obviously cotton grows in subtropical climates, doesn't grow here. So all those places like India, China and, and the Ottoman, the former Ottoman Empire, they were making cotton textiles and the Indians were making the best stuff. And we would, we would buy it from them. And then eventually we worked out how to make the machines that made it much quicker. So we undercut the, we undercut the Indians for about a century and a half. And then they bought the machinery that we made made and then they undercut us oh and you know and gandhi came to blackburn and stuck two fingers up at the british weavers and said well you might be starving now but you've you starved us for a century and a half so what goes around comes around lads but what happened in the in the latter part of the 20th century was that we kind of gave up on quality and we as a nation of consumers we became more interested in buying high volumes of stuff at low cost than about the quality of things in general you know we got much better machinery much more automated machinery and eventually that stopped making a big enough increase in profit then the businesses started to move those factories overseas and then literally millions of people lost their job at one point in time in the uk one in five jobs were in textiles in fact more than that one in five jobs were in cotton textiles more than a fifth of the population made clothes do do you know know what that is today i I mean i I know exactly what it is today I mean, I don't know in a percentage terms, but mm. we, we, uh, about 50 years ago, there were 1.6 million people making textiles and clothing in the UK. And today it's less than 100,000. Wow. Wow. And we buy five times as many pieces of clothing and we spend a third less. So our clothes mm. are incredibly cheap compared to what they were 50 years ago. And we don't even use half of them. In fact, mm. statistically, we only use a third of them. So we mm. buy so much cheap stuff. By buying all this cheap stuff, we've killed a million and a half really good skilled jobs. 
Mm. And we don't even wear the stuff we buy. And in fact, mm. a third of all the clothes produced on the planet every year don't even get sold. 2022, we made 100 billion pieces of clothing, 70% of them made with oil-based synthetics. Yeah. And a third of those never even got sold. Straight to landfill or incineration. It's utterly mental. It now feels inevitable that you ended up in, in Blackburn. We do still have all the very best bits of that textile industry. So the textile mm. bits that are left are the phenomenal quality ones because it's easy for people to copy low quality stuff. So mm. all of these countries around the world that, you know, it, also cotton textiles are much easier to make than woolen textiles and linen textiles. So cotton is easy. I mean, synthetics are really easy by comparison. But um, what is left in this country is the really, really good stuff. And community mm. clothing, everything we've ever sold, and we've been going now since uh, 2016, um, everything we've ever sold has been made in the UK. Most of it is made with UK made textiles. But we work with 45 factories now in the UK, and they're all bloody amazing. And lots mm. of them make for lots of other really expensive brands like Burberry and Hermes and Louis Vuitton and Prada and all these great brands and us. And Chanel, like we're in, I was in the factory the other week at the jump the place, the place that makes our jumpers. And there's like Chanel knitwear going down one line and there's community clothing down the other, which makes me feel like, and we sell ours for like 80 quid a jumper. So we work with 45 factories now and those factories in total employ around about 1,900 people. So it's not mm. a huge, but it, it's like, 2% of the entire national infrastructure in textiles and clothing, which is pretty good for a tiddly little brand that's kicked off five years ago with no money. Mm. What we're trying to do is encourage people to look differently at their clothes. So mm. we do only use natural materials. We try and make clothes that really last. We're not trying to sell you something. The reason we're called clothing and not fashion is because there is a real difference between clothing mm. and fashion. Clothing, clothing is driven by need. Mm. Fashion is driven by want. Yes. And our, our whole ethos, is, is, the way to solve this this catastrophic environmental problem in clothing is to stop buying as much stuff. Like mm. you can tinker around with the materials all you like. You know, you mm. can do, you can, you know, you can do leather made out of mushrooms until the cows come yep. home, but it's yep. going to make just a fucking gnat's whisker. Sorry, excuse my friend. It's going to make an absolute gnat's whisker <laughs> worth of difference. Burn, Blackburn uh, definition. <laughs> yeah. But the way to do this is to stop buying as much and the stuff you do buy, make sure that it is much lower impact. I've just written a book about all of this sort of stuff. And I, I, one of the things I do is I chart the kind of evolution of consumption. And for the first 30,000 years of our existence, we muddled along with almost nothing. And, you know, it wasn't like everyone for the first 30,000 years of human existence was miserable. That's clearly not the case. Up until around the, the, the sort of early 16th century, we were systematically told to not buy anything. Mm. Like, you know, it is our duty as good citizens of the world to live quietly with nothing, to not be envious, to not be mm. greedy. These were mortal mm. sins. Religious and moral philosophers and all of our, you know, leaders said, don't buy stuff, folks. Just, you know, be happy with what you've got. And mm. then at some point in time, they suddenly woke up. Really, it was the you know the point at which capitalism sprung up as a as a as a as an ideal and became well codified. Suddenly, all the people with money realised that if they could make more stuff and make us buy more stuff and keep that cycle going, they'd all get much richer. So suddenly, all of that stuff where they were telling us not to buy anything and it was ungodly to want things and envy was a bad thing, absolutely go for it, lads. We're going to make you buy as much stuff as we can possibly get you to put your hand in your pocket for. And it was a complete switch. And now, and for the last 300 years, that kind of the sophistication and the frequency with which we are sold things has ratcheted up and up and up and up and up. So mm. the volume, particularly in my industry, clothing, you know, they are, everybody's selling you stuff. You've got kids in schools influencing their peers on TikTok. You've got shopping being kind of gamified by people like Timu and Shein and, and those other brands. Because it's so cheap, it's become a completely thoughtless, unconsidered activity. A new top is less than the price of a cup of coffee. So why should I think twice? I'll just have it. And if it's rubbish, who cares? I'll just put it in the bin and move on. That apparatus of, 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 of consumption and driving consumption is so powerful and strong now. And so many big businesses make so much money out of it that it's really, really hard for anybody to shake 
themselves free. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that all of the data around what makes us happy is completely unconnected from the amount of physical things we have. And so the more stuff we buy, the more hooked on consumption we get. I mean, statistically in the UK over the last 50 years, we have got no happier. We've got 10 times richer as a nation, mm. but on average, we are not one bit happier. And in America, actually, they are less happy now than they were 60 years ago. To the two long solo expositions I did, and they were quite a way apart. So the first was uh, 2004, 20 years ago. 26 years old, which now feels absurdly young. Um, I spent 10 weeks, 72 days on my own on the Arctic Ocean. And, um, yeah. and interestingly, I was only wearing one set of clothes. And I, I think I changed my underwear a handful of times. But I, yeah. I, I, I'm not convinced I even had a mirror. I was maybe I had a tiny one just <laughs> checking I hadn't got frostbite on my face. Yeah, but well, I if you needed to pull a piece of you know, <laughs> shrapnel out of yeah, your forehead yeah. or something, yeah. <laughs> And it, and it struck me, I, I sort of, during that experience, part of me, I think, became a bit of a hippie. And I, I, I live quite close to Stroud now. So maybe like you yeah. and Blackburn, we sort of gravitate towards it. Anyway. But, um, but I, I remember sort of concluding after that journey, and, and even more so, the last big solo trip was 2017, 2018. So much more recently, that's, that's a couple of months in Antarctica on my own. But I've, with both of those trips, I thought that that's probably the longest I've ever gone without being marketed to. I didn't have a phone. I didn't have an interconnection. Didn't see my emails. Didn't there was no there's no no telly. No nothing. No civilization. You know, not once did I think the sorts of thoughts that one might think in back in the civilized world. Now I, I'm not. You know, I, I'm I'm like all of us are sort of conflicted and you know, yeah. Well, I think we're all conflicted. Beings, but... We're all <laughs> we all sometimes succumb to these urges. The, but the, I think, I think things. but I think that is okay. And I think I don't want to stop fashion. I, I mean, as a kid, I loved fashion and I still love it. There's certain things about it I still love. And I'm still, you know, I am drawn to these things. I'm drawn to the beauty of really nice objects more than I am drawn to some prat on TikTok showing me what they've, what they've got that day, you know, by clicking and wearing 17 outfits like that. Frankly, I couldn't give less of a stuff about. But, you know, there are still wonderful things in the world that are appealing because of their beauty and the craftsmanship and lovely things like that. So I think it's okay to desire things. I think it's only natural. Mm. But what mm. isn't natural is to base your entire kind of happiness system mm. on new stuff, providing you with a jolt of happiness all the time, because that mm. I think, feels hopeless. Like, if that is what you're pinning hope of your future happiness on, you really are in for a rude awakening at some point. Everyone growing up in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s had more than enough fashion. We don't need the volume of fashion we've got now, but we're somehow hooked on it. Well, I'm not, but, you know, lots of people sadly are. I mean, I'm like you. I mean, weirdly, so I've been writing this book, which is out in, in May, and I was thinking about what I'd be wearing, because I, I mean, and I'm wearing them today. These trousers, these are community clothing cameraman pants. Mm. And I got a pair of these as a try-on. We were just developing, and these were like the final production samples. And so I got them to wear test them in August. And I reckon I can count on one hand the number of days that I haven't worn them since. And there's a jumper over there that I put on in November. And it's a bit like the jumper you're wearing. It's a heavy gauge rib wall jumper. Mm. I put it on in November, and I haven't taken it off since. I've changed the T-shirt underneath. My socks and pants get changed, but I've literally what I, I always wear it. And I'm wearing this is one of the community clothing, organic, uh, plastic free sportswear tops. And I've, I've again, I'm wear, to, wear like wear testing now, even though we've launched it. But, you know, I'm just like we always want to check things and make sure that they are good. But I wear the same stuff all the time and it actually makes life bloody easy. Like what am I wearing today? Well, the stuff that I took off and folded up and put on my chair eight hours ago. <laughs> and I, you know what? I put it on and I'm like, oh, looks good today, just like it looked yesterday. And off I trundle. And I don't have to worry about it. And if I'm packing my bag to go anywhere, it's just a few socks and pants. <laughs> so there's a lot of data about what makes people happy. But the things that make people happy are hanging out with their friends and family, going for a walk. Sitting on the top of a mountain with a sandwich and a flask of tea, staring at mountaintops, yep. sitting in the garden, listening to the birds chirruping. That's mm. the stuff that makes people happy. Going to a gig, mm. listening to the music, it's all apart from going to gigs. Most of it's free. Most of it's free. And it's available to all of us. We just go outside and like wander around and we'll literally feel happier. You know, instead, we're sitting on our phones going mad for buying rubbish off Timu. And it's like, that doesn't make anyone happy. One of the yeah. one of the skills, one of the, the polar prerequisites, it turns out, is 
is an ability to sew because stuff just gets yeah, trashed. trashed. And, yeah. and when it's, yeah. So I was like constantly repairing stuff. And then three years later, 2004, always, I had a pair of mittens. I actually auctioned them at some charity dinner for years, but literally the mittens were in like a glass case. And because they were completely, the one of the thumbs was a different color because I had to bodge yeah. it up with something else. And I would sew, um, so everything up on expeditions with dental floss because a because I had some with me anyway from teeth. So it's like bomb proof. It's just yeah. it's just you know, set up with that and um, so um, yeah, my my darning skills I would say are, are kind of rudimentary and and uh, entirely functional. I, I'm not yeah. you know, but you know, but, but you know, it feels good to fix something, don't you? Love it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah, and I think, yeah. again, this is one of these things that people have kind of had forgotten about for a long time and now are mm. rediscovering. The reason so many of us watch and love the repair shop is because mm. it makes us feel good to fix something. You know, mm. most clothes get considerably worse the first time they're worn and then considerably worse the first time they're washed and then they fall apart. Whereas mm. good things get better and better and better. And I, was, I did this documentary about uniform for the coronation and one of the officers that I spoke to was talking about one of his new recruits who I think was a 16 17 year old lad and he got kitted out for the first time and he pulled his leather boots on and there was this sort of stunned like what on earth am I wearing sort of look on his face and turns out he'd never worn a pair of leather shoes in his entire life he'd only ever worn trainers and so the idea of pulling something on and he had that you know this officer had to explain to him that they will get better like you'll polish them you'll wear them you'll sweat in them they'll get wet they'll mold to your feet and they will get more and more comfortable the more you wear these things and you will have them probably for the rest of your life and he was like sort of stunned by this idea and that is the case with so many things it in our lives and i love the story of you fixing your mittens and again like other cultures value these things far more you know in japan mm. you've got mm. this idea of borrow so the more something is fixed and patched the mm. more valuable it becomes because that becomes part of its story its use its failure its repair all of that becomes you know all of that love and skill that goes into fixing and repairing things becomes part of the value of the piece and we need to learn more of that because it is a genuine pleasure like you know you know when you pull on a really good pair of shoes or a, uh, you know that suit from norton's it feels better and the more you wear it the better it gets i wanted to to dig into an, another side of of i don't think just that business but i think your your factories plural the wind power the renewable energy all the waste materials recycled for, i think for, for a lot of business owners like you that that they, they they might feel like that is too big of a switch to make right now. It's not economically. Like, how, how did you do that? So at Community Clothing, we don't own the factories. So we, mm. I mean, I, I, it's a slightly odd position because I am, I am a major shareholder in Community Clothing and mm. I am the majority shareholder of Cookson and Clegg. So okay. we're not the same business, but they're, yes. they're, they're under the yeah. same sort of umbrella. But most of the factories that we use are independent of us and, and are owned by independent. So mostly they're private, family owned, multi-generational, mm -hmm. all the rest of it. But, you know, they all make their own decisions. But we encourage a certain way of behaving. We certainly encourage the use of green energy. You know, I mean, we don't have our own. Annoyingly, I mean, I, I do like my landlord, but he wouldn't let us put solar panels on the roof. And God, it annoyed the hell out of me. I actually saw this really cool wind turbine technology that a lot of that, that um, go small. Um, uh, I can't remember what they're called, but they, they funnel the air. You put them on the edge of a building and they draw air upwards. Mm, and when yes. the wind blows, they're, they're sort of like little vertical columns. They're quite squat. They're only a few meters. They're like four mm. meters tall by four meters wide or a couple mm. of meters wide. And, um, you know, lots of people are looking at them now um, rather than big, you know, traditional kind of wind turbines. But, you know, some of the businesses we work with um, – use entirely renewable energy and, and we encourage that we can't force it we can't mandate it but we mm. we encourage it and we we you know one of the things we do by the way we operate is we give people the confidence that we are here for the long term you know the people that make our socks we've got orders going forward the next three years on those socks like so we give them the confidence that they can start thinking a bit more long term because if you're in an industry that's been declining for 50 years it's very hard to make forward looking steps you're all constantly just trying to keep the lights on and but by the way that we operate, we are able to give people the confidence that we're here for the mm. long run. And mm. things go up and down. But generally, there's nobody that we have ever started working with that we no longer work with. Every factory that we work with, we choose with great care and we give them a long term, long term vision that, that we are in it for the long run. Mm. But also it's about traceability. It's about adhering to environmental standards on the way that they treat their waste. It's about understanding exactly their entire supply chain. 
um, you know, we can trace quite a lot of our products all the way back to the farm. So that's on both cotton and on wool. There is a resurgence in artisan manufacturing. So that is where the person who makes it sells it to you. So that you're sort of cutting out the middleman. And I think there is there is a lot of movement towards that because, again, you're kind of redistributing the value in the in the the, the economics of it in a much more for me. I think the people that make stuff should get more money than the people that sell it. A lot of manufacturers aren't directly connected with the customer because they sell to a brand and the brand sells to the customer. So they don't hear what we hear. We're standing in pop-up shops and getting emails from customers. And a lot of people are saying the same thing. You know, they want to understand what's happening in the supply chains of the products they buy. Now, at the moment, that's a small number of people. There are loads and loads of people who don't care. But I think the general direction of travel is, if you think about the sort of broad continuum, there are people that know and have changed their habits. There are people, a bigger number of people that know but haven't changed their habits, either because they don't care or they can't afford to. And then there's a huge chunk of people that still, I mean, it seems astonishing to me, but still don't understand the harm that all of this stuff does. But it's just a question of education and everybody is moving in the same direction. We're not going to get to a point in 10 years time where we turn around and say, you know what, I really liked all that organic cotton, but what I'd like now is more oil. We are never turning that clock back. So businesses need to understand there is only one direction of travel, and that is towards lower consumption, less harm, more harmony with nature. All of that stuff is the only direction we are going to go in because consumers are not going to nobody's going to change their mind and think I'd like to see more dead turtles, please. That is not the way like nobody is that is never going to happen. So that is the direction we all need to be heading in. I'm intrigued about where this comes from. Like you, you have this obvious deep understanding of the the, the the sort of legacy, the cost, the impact environmentally, socially of, of, of the, the industry that you're working in and you're clearly changing things. Um, but where does that sense of, like what I'm sensing is a real sense of stewardship for the, the natural world, for, for people. Where does that come from? Well, I was outdoors all the time as a kid. I was very lucky. I grew up in Edinburgh, like across the road was a what is now a nature reserve called the Hermitage of Bray. Mm. And it's just a great big wooded valley and as kids that's where we were we were in that place building dens damming the river catching stuff you know just hanging out in nature but you know i had nature books i had like the you know the ladybird book of trees you know i watched nature documentaries i watched life on earth with david attenborough and i watched all this stuff and i was a member at edinburgh zoo there was a thing called the gannett club edinburgh zoo which we did in the holidays so we'd go to edinburgh zoo and they teach us about animals and wildlife i just really like it i like it makes me really happy I grew up in an area, so I grew up in Edinburgh. My grandparents, my granddad worked in the textile industry and then the firm he worked for, actually, you know, he'd finished that before before I was old enough to realize what he was doing. But he had been, he'd worked in the spinning industry and then his job was as the development officer for the borders. And the borders is a region that lost thousands and in fact, probably 40,000 jobs in a period of about 40 years in the textile industry when that went. And it was devastating. And also you can't fail, I've, I've lived in Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, and now spend a lot of time in Blackburn, you cannot fail to see the human cost of our change in behavior in terms of the destruction of communities, the loss of livelihoods, the loss of health, the rise in antisocial behavior. I mean, all of this stuff that, that contributes to the lessening of people's enjoyment living in these places. Completely agree. You used a word earlier, uncompromising. And, and thinking of, let's call them fashion brands, can only make um, trade-offs on I don't know, you know, quality, price, the way that the people that make the clothes are treated. And, and it strikes me that you have, I can't see that you've sacrificed anything here. Like, how, how, have you, how have you done that? So the idea behind community clothing was born out of a desire to want to sustain and create jobs in the UK textile industry and make good clothes, really good clothes, and make them affordable. So that was the baseline that we started with. So the rest of the model was built around delivering that. So how do you do that? Well, I mean, you go back to the simple principle that if you make something really good and you sell it at a decent price and there's nothing bad in anything that you do, then if people find out about it and buy it and like it, they'll come back and they'll buy something else. And that's the principle. Like, what's not to like about good clothes at a good price that are supporting jobs down the road? And that's our thing. So we don't spend money on marketing. We don't spend money designing new collections. This training top that I'm wearing now will be in the collection next year and the year after. You know, these trousers will be the same in 15 years time. 
Like, we don't have to redesign our clothes. The only reason we redesign clothes every six months or three months or week or day, depending on what your business is, is to encourage people to buy more stuff. And we're not trying to encourage people to buy more stuff. In fact, we're trying to encourage people to buy less stuff. But the reason that works is there are 66 million people in this country and they all need some clothing. If even 1% of them buy clothing from us, that's way more than we can deal with. So we don't need to be artificially incentivizing people to buy more stuff. We never have a sale. So the price is the same all year round. And it's the best price we can do. And so it's never, there's never a cheap time to buy. We're never trying to flog you something at the end of the season. So we don't have all of that. Like we've just simplified it. It's like, it's good stuff, good prices. What's not to like? Amazing. To read back to you something um, that was you did an interview with the FT recently. Uh, you said uh, we could transform the entire British clothing industry from one that currently produces huge quantities of low value products by making the UK an economy that consumes very small quantities of very high quality product with high quality locally sourced material. You can then create a whole secondary industry that deals with repair. Now you, you've touched on these things already, but but this feels like the the antithesis to to the the sort of evil fast fashion industry yeah. but how how can how can we uh, how can we make this happen generally as consumers we have a choice we spend we spend we still spend a fair amount of money on our clothes but what we can choose to do is to choose to be more thoughtful about how we mm. how we spend it and um in the in the back of the book that I'm that uh, that I'm doing there's a list of what I call artisan makers so this is companies that make their own stuff and sell it themselves, which is generally, in my opinion, the way to buy really good stuff. So if a, if a company makes its own product and sells it to you, there's a fair likelihood that they're going to want to do a good job because it's probably the only thing they do. And if they do, don't do a do good job of it, they're buggered. So, you know, and there are, there are, there are, you know, there are, there are, there are companies like Agui, Rucksacks and mm. PhD, but they, you know, they have their own factory in, in, in Cumbria and, mm. Or they live and die by making that one thing. And when you buy a thing from them, all the money goes to them. Instead of buying 10 cheap things, buy one good thing that you really care about. And that one good thing will probably last you and you will get more enjoyment. And every time you use it, like you with your egg with rucksack, you'll think there's something great about this. You know, it really works. It's great quality. And I know where it's come from. And I know that the money I spent you know, they're not inexpensive rucksacks, but mm. all of that money is going into good materials and highly skilled people that are living and breathing the idea of making good stuff. And that, mm. I think, is is what we can all we can all do. And I think, mm. you know, there's no point repairing like it doesn't make any economic sense to repair something really cheap. You know, if you've bought a top for three quid, it's going to cost you five quid to like you can yeah. like so. But if you buy something good, it is worth repairing. And then like the more we get back into making things, the more skills we have for repairing them. And personally, I think like got to go back to school, like kids need to kids need to be taught how to make stuff at school because you can't make good judgments about quality if you don't know anything about how things are made. We have to just be more thoughtful. We, we have to just take stock, like give yourself a pat on the back for not buying something. I did a lecture at the Royal Geographical Society and there's some of the notes, some of the some of the graphics from that are in the appendix in the book. But it's like you can have the same value of industry. You you know, the clothing industry in the UK, I can't remember what the number is, but it's in the billions. But you can have an industry that's exactly the same monetary value, but which has like 20 percent of the amount of new stuff. And that 20 mm. percent is actually just good stuff rather than terrible stuff. Mm. So we can shift from a high volume, low quality, low value economy to a low volume, high quality, high value economy. Like that's just a choice we can all make. Some mm. people cannot afford these things. Mm. The, the Terry Pratchett boot parable, you know, the rich man can afford 50 quid on a pair of boots and they last him for 10 years. The poor man can only afford a 10 pound boot and it only lasts a year. So he spends twice as much in the long run and his feet are always wet. There are people that cannot afford to buy a good pair of socks or a good pair of you know, a good jumper. Somehow we've got to get over that because just just making them buy more and more terrible quality rubbish is not helping them at all.
Mm. It's not helping anybody and it's certainly destroying the planet. That needs to be addressed. But somehow we just, we like those of us that can afford to need to just be more thoughtful. I spent a bit of time recently with some extraordinarily talented young people um, with Central St. Martin's Universities. In fact, two, they've got two master's uh, courses. One was MA Fashion uh, and one was um, a really cool course called uh, Material Futures. I met someone who's a glass blower, a philosopher, a poet, like weird and wonderful. And, and all thinking along remarkably similar lines to 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 you i mean even the 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 fashion master students so i was i was inspired by that but my question is what 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 makes you excited about the future funnily enough it is some of the things that you've just mentioned look the the fashion industry in britain has always you know we've always had we've had a good fashion industry for a long long time and um you know, we, we, we had a huge textiles and clothing industry. And then we were very big in fashion, you know, in the 60s and 70s, we were one of the, you know, we're one of the, you know, the leading fashion centers of the world. And we always have been. And our universities have always turned out lots of great designers mm. with great visions. And I think what is really interesting is that if you look at the students leaving places like St. Martin's and LCF and all the other kind of University of the Arts, London colleges, and many other great uh, fashion and textile schools in the UK. So many of them now are thinking along different lines. So many of them are thinking, I can only carry on doing this if I do this in a way that doesn't kill the planet. And there are so many cool young designers that are making new stuff out of old stuff. And there's not, you cannot, you cannot leave one of these colleges now without understanding the role you play in shaping a less harmful future in terms of the, the industry that you're in. But so many cool designers are making stuff out of found objects, recovered textiles, mm. you know, old mm. stuff. And that takes real, not only does it take great creativity, it also takes great skill. Because it's mm. very easy to produce new stuff in a factory from virgin oil-based synthetics. Any idiot can do that. But what yeah. takes great skill is to make a highly desirable object made out of old stuff. Mm. That takes real creativity and talent. And also the number of young people who are very consciously opting out of supporting the fast fashion industry. I mean, there are far more that are continuing to support it, but it is a movement. It is becoming uncool to buy fast fashion. And that feels very significant. I came across this concept and it's a, it's a term in psychology called enclothed cognition. The clothes we wear can change our cognition, you know, the, the way that we think. Now, the, the experiment, I believe, was not that long, you know, 10 years ago. Um, I'm not sure the university, but uh, it was, and the experiment was with white lab coats. So basically, if you wear a white lab, given a white lab coat, you become slightly brainier, you're better at remembering things, doing doing experiments. But is, is this... Is this go something, something you've experienced now? Now, now, um, now, you, now you've heard this term, and and if so, you know what, what can you share from your experiment? Clothing has a real power to transform the way we think about ourselves and present ourselves. Like physically, you know, you know that putting on the uniform of something makes you feel more like that something. You know, that's why soldiers put uniform on; it makes them feel. You know, business people put on a suit and they feel more businesslike. What is clear is that clothes have a power to do things to our unconscious mind. You can feel differently about yourself based on the clothes that you're wearing. And certainly when you feel very comfortable in the clothes you're wearing, I think it allows you to think in a more generous way. And certainly when you are dressed in a way that you don't feel comfortable, it diminishes your ability to be yourself and be yourself to the full potential. So I can see why it's true. I don't think I can think of specific examples when it happened. I mean, I did used to wear quite a lot of lab coats in my undergraduate days. And actually, funny enough, we make the lab coats that you have to wear when you go to the Rolls Royce factory, when you walk oh. around and inspect your car. We Love make it. Those. Well, clothing is a fascinating and powerful thing. And um, I'm now going to be very conscious of my clothed... <laughs> enclosed, 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 my enc enclosed cognition, yes. There yeah. we go. Excellent. And if we, if we had to... Uh, edit this entire podcast down to, to one minute, what, what would be your takeaway? And I'm assuming it's along the lines of, of sort of buy less, but better. The book I've written is called Less. Uh, and the, I mean, the, the subtitle is Stop words. Buying So Much Rubbish. Yeah, I've done it in one word, just less. Um, <laughs> but um, no, that's it. I think we can find far more enjoyment in life by having much stronger connections to the things that we live with. I mean, it's that William Morris idea of not having anything in your house that isn't either beautiful or useful. And I think that is 
that is something we've all forgotten. And and I think not only can 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 the way we buy have a positive impact on our own happiness, it can absolutely have a fundamentally positive effect on the happiness of lots of other people who are involved in making it and the happiness and health of the planet. Wonderful. Um, Patrick, it's been an absolute joy. Thank you. I'm assuming the best place for if people want to know more that well, we should send them to community clothing if they want something both, co. UK. Yeah, both useful and beautiful for their yeah. wardrobes. Patrick, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure, Ben. Thanks so much.